Hello, great to see you all this morning. We are going to jump straight into the Bible. And the passage we are looking at is John 5, verses 5 to 9. It will come up on the screen so you can follow along. And it says this. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. I'd love to speak to you this morning about hope when you feel stuck. A bit about me is that I grew up in London. I've always said the other end, and I've learned recently that it's not the other end. It's the same end of London, but London is just massive. And when people ask me where I'm from, I often say Richmond, Twickenham area, and people respond with like a, ooh, very fancy. And so just keeping it real from the start, it wasn't actually Richmond, Twickenham. It wasn't far away, but it was in a place called Hampton, which is significantly less, ooh, than Richmond. Um, And to give you a picture of what life looked like at the time, and neither of my parents were raised with any Christian background, so we'd never really been to church. Um, And both of my parents were raised in circumstances which didn't set them up very well. Uh, So my mum's own mum was an alcoholic and had my mum when she was 15. And there was this sort of family history which filtered down from uh, grandparents to parents and into my own life. And my parents had a complex relationship uh, with each other, but also with alcohol and drugs. And uh, that relationship ended when I was uh, four years old. Uh, When I was six months old, uh, my parents didn't have much money and uh, they turned to other ways of making money. My dad was arrested and sent to prison. And uh, when my parents split, my dad left and I stayed with my mum, who is uh, the best. She's amazing and strong, but she found the juggle of trying to raise a young child on her own and hold down a full-time job a lot. And so after a few months of juggling that, uh, my mum lost her job and we ended up homeless. And so we lived in hostels across London. London. And I am constantly impressed by people who can remember the fine details of their childhood because for me those sort of middle years are a little bit blurry but one significant thing that happened is my mum got into a new relationship and she had my baby sister Jazz, which I call her my baby sister, she's 18 now, um, had my sister Jazz who was born with a series of heart conditions and a cleft lip and I think for my family that began to bring to the surface uh, some of the things that were going on for us deep down. And if you fast forward um, to 15, it's clear when I look at family life that there was this element of desperation. Uh, Me and my family needed, desperately, desperately needed God's intervention to break off generational ties, to heal my sister physically, to bring about freedom from addiction and to give us hope for the future. And so as I began uh, my teenage years, I kind of carried with me this desperation. And I didn't know where to go, what to do. And being totally honest, I don't think I really thought there was anywhere I could go that was different from where uh, my parents and grandparents and the people before me had been. Um, So I was kind of making everything up when I was 15. Um, And over my childhood, there is this sort of evidence of um, seeking or exploring faith. Um, My mum would go through phases where we'd go to like a mind, body and soul exhibition or we'd go to a spiritualist church and we'd kind of go in, we'd talk about it a bit and then it would fade. So nothing really kind of stuck in our family and became a firm foundation. So we just kept asking these questions. And uh, when I was a teenager, my mum did a skydive and she was scared and she found herself praying but didn't know where she was praying, uh, who she was praying to. And one day she went out for a walk and saw a banner on a big old church building and that invited people to come along to Alpha. So it wasn't a surprise to me uh, that in a moment where my mum was feeling lonely and low that she ended up doing Alpha. Uh, But what was a surprise to me was that after a few Wednesday evenings of her going out for dinner, that's how she phrased it. She kind of vaguely mentioned it was a church thing, but she'd always say, I'm going out for dinner. And, And after a few of these Wednesday evenings, she came back a different person. Because what happened to Alpha, what happened to my mum on Alpha meeting Jesus changed her. 
And so uh, this phase kind of didn't end. If you fast forward a few months, I'm about 15, um, and it was a Sunday morning. I remember really clearly I was at a friend's house, and I was quite hungover, as I would be most Sunday mornings. Um, and kind of prior to this, my mum would have nothing really going on on a Sunday morning, so she'd come and pick me up, and she'd, yeah, it, it wasn't such a fight. But this Sunday morning in particular, um, my mum put up a real fuss about coming to get me, and I was not impressed. I was a really stubborn teenager, um, and in Greater London on a Sunday, the buses take at least eight minutes to come. And for me, that was too long to wait. Uh, and so I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and I put up such a big fuss. And eventually, um, my mum caved and she said, OK, fine, I'll come and get you. I'll be there soon. And so mum arrives to pick me up from this friend's house and I get in the car and we start driving. And mum's a bit grumpy, I'm a bit grumpy, I've got like makeup on from the night before still, I'm not in a good state. And mum starts driving, but she drives not in the direction of our house. She drives and pulls up outside a church building. And I was so unimpressed and she turned and looked straight at me and said, I'm going in so you can come in with me or you can stay in the car. I was like, okay, cool. So what you need to know about me at this stage is that on any personality test I have ever done, I come up as about 97% extrovert. Uh, and so the idea of going into church felt really, really scary, but it felt a little bit less scary than being left in my own company for too long. So I caved... <laughs> And I walked into church. I was terrified. I've never really been in a church building. Um, and the atmosphere was just different to anything I had ever, ever been in before. People were really nice, which was a surprise to me. Uh, people looked genuinely quite happy. And they welcomed me. They asked me questions about my life and were interested in me. And I left the service having not really listened uh, to anything that was said at all. I just sat with this lady who asked me questions and seemed like a nice person. And I remember leaving the church thinking, I don't know what that lady has, but she has something and I want it. And now I know that the thing that set this lady apart was the presence of the Holy Spirit in her. Uh, but I remember in that moment, that was when my expectations completely shifted. I went from just presuming that Jesus wasn't real and therefore my life would turn out a certain way to considering that if Jesus was real, it might have even just a little bit of impact on the way that my life turned out. And so that began for me, this journey of getting to know Jesus. And this November just gone marks 10 years since I was baptised and gave my life to Jesus. And it's amazing to reflect on this story of the way that God has transformed my life, because these last 10 years have looked nothing at all like I'd have guessed. Jesus completely transformed my life and gave me hope when I felt really stuck in this kind of generational pattern. And so if you're feeling stuck this morning, he will do the same for you. Because many of us have areas in our life that we feel stuck in. Things that we think have to be the way that they are just because they've always been that way. Trajectories that we think are inevitable. Things that feel out of our control and areas where we are desperately longing for breakthrough. And perhaps you're here this morning or you're watching online and you feel really bored at work. Or you're finding it impossible to save any money because every time you get somewhere, a cost comes up and then you have to start again. Or your relationships feel tricky and they aren't working out. Or you're having difficulty with your health. Or perhaps, like me, you look at the generations that have gone before you or even the people around you in your life right now and you think that your life has to work out a certain way. And this passage is good news for us. It tells us, firstly, that Jesus comes towards our brokenness. In verse 5 and 6, we read, One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And we read in this story a man who is stuck. 
He has been in this condition for 38 years. That is a long time. And when I first read this passage, I pay attention to a man who seems quite proactive. He's kind of near the pool. He's surrounded with people who are in a similar condition or in a similar state to him and need some healing. But as you dig into the passage, you almost come across the apathy of this man who's almost made it to the pool but has given up, is lying down and is just waiting for something to happen. Perhaps this man has accepted his circumstances as they are and given up hope. I mentioned earlier my sister, Jazz, who was born with a series of heart conditions. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but the way that I understand mitral valve stenosis is that it's when the valves in your heart are too narrow to properly pump the blood around. And she also had a hole in her heart. And she'd kind of lived all of her life with this condition, which didn't have major symptoms, but there was always like a, an appointment or an operation date pending. She'd had a couple of operations. Um, and she just had kind of prayed for healing for many, many years. And I remember a few years ago, we were at Focus, which is the week away in the summer that we go on with churches from all across the HDB network. And I was serving on the youth team. Uh, and it came to a Wednesday evening, and my sister ran up to me. A tears filled her eyes, and she looked at me and just asked, why me? And I had never really seen her in this distressed way before. So I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know how to explain the fact that God hadn't healed her. Um, and, but I knew that what we could do was get around her and pray. So a group got around her. They laid hands on her and just asked God for his help healing her. And at the time, Jazz describes that she felt something shift in her body. But obviously, it's hard to tell with a heart condition if anything's actually changed. So um, she kind of left feeling hopeful, but not really sure what had happened. And she had an appointment coming up later that week. So she went along to the Royal Brompton, just down the road, and uh, had all the scans as normal. And it got to the end of the appointment. And the doctor turned to her and my mum, who were there, and said, it's as if by magic, the problem has totally gone. And I still can't explain um, why God heals some people and doesn't heal others. But I know that he promises to each of us to be with us in all things. Jesus sees this man lying down. And rather than kind of ignoring it and pretending that everything's okay, it is the first thing he does. He addresses this man's brokenness and asks him, do you want to be well? And we can be so fearful of opening up to the people around us about the stuff that feels sticky and difficult in our lives. I wonder how many times someone has asked you on a really, really rubbish day how you're doing and you've responded with, oh yeah, great, thanks, how are you doing? And I think this hesitation sometimes is due to the fact that we kind of know that we can open up to someone and tell them our stuff and that's quite a vulnerable and brave thing to do. And even if we do that, uh, they can listen, but there's not really anything that they can do. But it's not like that with Jesus. Jesus comes towards your brokenness. He has compassion on you. And he also has the power to change your circumstances. This morning, I want to let you know that even if you have given up hope in your circumstances and they feel impossible, Jesus acknowledges and engages in the issue of this man's brokenness and he will do the same for you. Whether you're at home watching or you're in the building, there is nothing that you need to hide from Jesus. He created you, he designed every detail of you. He died on the cross to forgive everything that you have ever done and everything that you ever will do. And he loves you so much. So you can bring everything in your life to him. All of the stuff that even feels a bit tricky to go into with anyone else, you can bring it to Jesus. So do you feel stuck in your job? Do your relationships feel like they're going nowhere? Do you desperately need financial provision or physical healing? Or are you longing for breakthrough in your family? You don't need to sit alone in your mess any longer. 
however you've walked in this morning, however you've logged on this morning, whatever you are feeling, Jesus loves you and comes towards you. And nothing is too big for him to handle. All we need to do is acknowledge the brokenness in our lives and invite him into it. And the second thing this passage tells us for when we feel stuck is that Jesus is our hope. Verses seven and eight say, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. I heard a story the other day that I'd love to share with you um, about a lady who was at Embankment Station just before Christmas 2012. Uh, Apparently she looked quite distressed and so uh, the staff at Embankment Station were approached um, with this lady in tears and her asking, where has the voice gone? And the staff weren't really sure what she was talking about. They asked what voice she meant. And she explained that she meant the voice that announces, mind the gap when you're waiting for the tube. And they explained that uh, the system had been updated, there was this new digital system, and so she didn't need to worry because the announcement would still be made, it was just a different voice. And as they chatted, it became clear that this voice belonged uh, to this lady's husband, a guy called Oswald Chambers, who was a theatre actor who died in 2007. And this lady, Margaret, was his wife. She would come to Embankment Station every day to sit to listen to and to be comforted by the voice of her late husband. And she would go to Embankment Station for this comfort and for this hope. And it might not be an underground station for you, but I wonder where you go when you feel stuck. Perhaps you find yourself doom scrolling through the news or tapping through Instagram or swiping through Tinder or pouring one more glass of wine, or clicking next episode and just watching one more on Netflix, or placing another shopping order. We read that although this man tried to go to a place and not a person, it's not the place that made him well. It is Jesus who commands the man to pick up his mat and to walk the man had an encounter with Jesus and that is what transformed him. That is what made him well. And you are invited today and every day to come to that same person. Today, I want you to know that Jesus comes towards your brokenness and that he is your hope in whatever you are going through. My sister was physically healed in a miraculous way. My mum was set free from addiction and given a whole new life. And God turned my life around, gave me hope and joy and set me free from these generational patterns that could have kept me bound. The promise that God makes to you today is that he comes towards your brokenness, it doesn't scare him away and that he is your hope when you feel stuck. And so we're going to pray. I'd love to invite you to stand. And we're just going to invite the Holy Spirit. So uh, whether you're in the building or you're watching at home, um, you might just want to take a stance of being ready to receive from the Holy Spirit. I find it helpful to close my eyes and place my hands out in front of me. It just helps me not get distracted. just going to pray, come Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Jesus, that you come towards all of the things that we push to one side. We thank you for the hope that we can find in only you. And so we invite you this morning to come and be with us, to do what only you can do. Come, Holy Spirit.
just get a sense that um, when I described what happened with my sister at Focus, um, and as she approached me with her eyes filled with tears, I just got a sense that there may be people in here or at home who, when I said that, your eyes filled with tears, because you could really resonate with that feeling of being at the end of yourself. And if that's you, God sees you. He's with you. I think he wants to refresh your hope this morning. And I get a sense that uh, there may be people who, uh, you came in this morning really questioning how you could be a good friend or a family member to someone you know who is really, really struggling. I got a sense that it might be around a physical health issue. Um, but that you've not really known what to do or how to respond. And I just sense that God wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit to give you fresh courage to not avoid the situation, but to kind of face it head on. And I think that God just wants you to know that, that he is with you in the conversations that you've been having. And just as the band come up, we're going to continue in worship in a moment, but just continue receiving the Holy Spirit. And we've got a sense that God wants to refresh hope um, for someone in being a good friend or family to someone, but just would love to give an opportunity for anyone who has come in here this morning just sensing um, that you really need this hope in your life at the moment. And if it might be around a career thing as well. Um, but if that's you, we'd love to pray for you. And so if you want to receive the Holy Spirit that fills you with hope, would you just pop your hand in the air? If you're at home, just receive the Holy Spirit where you are. Thank you, thank you. And I wonder if the rest of us, if, if we could look around, if you just keep your hand up, um, there's someone near you, we, we can't move, but if you could just stretch out a hand and bless what the Holy Spirit is already doing. Yes, yeah, so if we have a look around, there's a few hands up. There's one just, and one at the very back as well. Thank you. And we pray, Lord Jesus, for anyone who is here or watching online who desperately feels as though they need this fresh sense of hope. Who feel as though they're at the end of themselves. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit afresh. Pray for anyone who's feeling the pressure of having to be the hope to other people, that they would know that your spirit is filling them up, giving them the words, and giving them the strength. And just as the band begin playing, um, I'd love to encourage each of us as we head into this time of worship the guy that we read about in this story, the thing that really changed him is an encounter with Jesus. And so whether this is something that is really familiar to you or feels brand new, I'd love to encourage us to step into this time with a sense of expectation that it is this encounter with Jesus, it is coming to him that changes your heart, but also changes the circumstances around you. Take this opportunity for an encounter with Jesus and let's worship together. <laughs>